We're now going to start adding the wall above. Now we're just going to be using the same sort of methods that we've been using previously. So there's a lot of copying and pasting or dragging and copying that we can do. So that's really good. So we don't need to draw from scratch. There's one construction potential problem or error that we might want to deal with first. When we're dealing with a timber floor like this, apart from the fact that it could also require bracing, which we've created through herringbone strutting, we also might need a double joist underneath. So what we can do is select all of this, drag it across 45, and double up, move, drag, and copy this joist. So we now have a double joist underneath the bottom plate of the wall. So I'll drag a copy of this one up. This tie down plate is the same size. So that top plate or bottom plate needs to be 90 by 45. Again, in this particular house, it's probably more like a 70 or 75 millimeter stud, but it's also Oregon or hardwood, not necessarily pine. So we're not going to necessarily be drawing it as we see it. We're going to be drawing it as it could or should be drawn uh, based on more current construction methods. Then in terms of what do we see above that, we have our stud. So I'm going to pick up the settings of our bearer because it's basically the same. It's in elevation, it's not in section. And then I'm going to start drawing up. I'm going to use my rotated rectangular method. So I go across 90 and then I go up. Now I don't need to draw the whole wall, so I can just draw a little bit like this. I need to put insulation between my studs, so I'm going to copy my insulation. Drag a copy of that, rotate, move it into place, and stretch it down. So I only want this one to be 90 millimeters. Now, as my stud wall goes up, there are some other bits and pieces that we see along the way. So there's a bottom plate, there's a top plate, and there's often another piece of timber, either one or two in the middle of the wall, and we call that a noggin. Move, drag a copy. So we'll drag that up 300 just to be nice. And in this instance, I'm just going to split this wall. That doesn't happen in constructed reality, just so it's not changing the consistency of the fill. And now that would not be 300 millimeters. That would actually normally be halfway up the stud or a third of the way up the stud, depending on how tall the stud was. And so again, we're going to have a cover fill, display or to bring to front, which is hiding that. And what, again, we're showing in this case just like here, we're showing that this wall is a lot taller than this, but we're just not showing everything that's in between because it's sort of boring. It's repetitive, so we don't need to re-represent it. Now that same thing will happen above, so we'll just continue that up. We want to find that insulation, so we'll copy that, drag a copy. And then that will finish when we get to the top with another plate. So we'll drag a copy of that one. And again, we'll have another copy of this. And this will be our top plate. Now we don't necessarily need to show the noggin um, because it's fairly standard. And now our top plate is defined or is defining usually where our roof or ceiling sits. So what is our roof or ceiling? Now this is where I'm maybe going to go slightly off of the conventional or off of what we um, see on site. This can work in different ways. So I'm going to draw this as a standard type of configuration first, and then I'll come back and explain, well, what's happening in this particular house instance. So we're going to draw a, another timber piece on top of this, and this is going to be our ceiling joist. So we'll make it 90 millimeters high again. Then we'll have our, a rafter, which is often, again, effectively the same type of thing. So we'll use the same piece of timber, but we might make this one a little bit taller. So we're going to drag a copy, and we're going to move this one to this corner, and we're going to rotate it. Move, rotate. Now, what is the angle? And when I rotate, I'll be a little bit more specific, that I want to rotate from this outside corner of the top 
rotate it. Let's do 25 degrees. That didn't work. Let's try that again. A25. There we go. Now this is our rafter, this is our ceiling joist. Now depending on the type of construction this is, if this was created as a truss, let's give it a 600 millimeter eave. That could be created as a piece of timber that is chopped and there could be a gang nail plate that fixes these together. This runs up continuously and then we have webs in between. So we could create it like that and that's all that happens. If this was conventionally done, however, it could look slightly different. This would probably be bigger so at the moment it's 90, so let's make it 55 millimeters larger. So now we're talking about a 145. And if it's a bigger piece of timber, it could also be notched. So let's notch it down. That much is probably slightly excessive, but we'll do that for now. The ceiling joist is 90 by 45, and in this case what would happen is that the ceiling joist would run through, but it's dashed, so we'd show it as dashed in the distance. So we could have a notched rafter, and our ceiling joist runs behind the rafter, so we'll show it as a dashed line. I've made it 145 tall, and it's probably something else. We're now going to place a batten on top of that, and we're going to make this batten, let's make it 45 by 45. Rotate, and then we'll multiply that one at 600 centers. Move, multiply, spread, 600, and of course the advantage of that is we're doing it on an angle. Now we could also have a batten underneath our ceiling joist. Now I would tend to put a batten underneath the ceiling joist partly for insulation, partly for fixing, and partly depending on the type of cornice that I'm doing. If I'm trying to do a shadow mold cornice or a P50, having a ceiling batten really helps to make that work. So I'm going to reduce the size of this batten down 10 millimeters. So this one is a 45 by 35 mil batten. Now the intention of this is that I can then have plasterboard. So let's go find something that's going to be appropriate for plasterboard. Pen number two. Background is white or a very light grey maybe. I'll draw it from top to bottom at the moment and I'll make this 10 millimeter stick. Now the reality is that it's very rare. I'll make it white because it's way too dark. We don't want it to sit on the ground. That's dangerous. And it's hard to actually create that way. It's going to suck up any moisture if there's any moisture. So I'll, I'll lift that up 20 millimeters. 10 would be fine. And I'll bring this down 10 millimeters. And that means 
I can, let's do the ceiling plasterboard as well. So drag a copy and rotate. I could have my plasterboard butt up into my wall plasterboard, or if I wanted to have a shadow detail, I could have a 15 or 20 mil gap. And then I could have a P50 angle. That'll do to represent that. which is creating a little shadow line and that's my cornice. So that's one of the reasons why I'd have a, a ceiling batten under the ceiling joist if I wanted to create a detail like that because if I don't have that detail then this trim looks horrible against the rough edge of the plasterboard which can never perfectly sit flush with it. And of course the reason why I don't need to have my plasterboard all the way down to the ground because similarly we can have an architrave, we'll just take, create a very simple one for now. Sorry, skirting board. And that skirting board means that it's hiding the bottom edge of my plasterboard. Now this ceiling batten again, depending on the type of plasterboard, could be at 600 centers or it could be at 450 centers. We'll just do 450 because it's consistent with the floor joists. And we'd have multiple layers of insulation. We'd have some insulation that sits between the roof battens and some insulation that sits in the ceiling joists. Change the settings of this one. Now, when I draw this insulation, it's probable that the insulation doesn't sit perfectly between these ceiling joists. What does it do? It depends on what my roofing material is made from. Now my roofing material in this case is probably going to be metal roof sheeting, colour bond, and that's what it is in this particular house, except the roof profile is much flatter than this. But let's just talk about a standard system. So what I'm going to do with this particular insulation is flip it, move, mirror. And I'm going to turn on the contours in this case. I want the, the top and the sides on, which is now actually on the bottom. And I want to change the angle of that. Minus 45, minus 45, because what I'm showing is that there is a insulation 
uh, sarking that goes over and under, or over and over. And then my roof sheeting sits on top of that. R16 for custom orb. And so the insulation is effectively being squished underneath the roof sheeting in this case, and that's ensuring that I don't end up having an issue with condensation, building up on the underside of my metal. So that's called anti-con, would be a, a brand name of that type of insulation. There's just a little bit more detailing we need to add, but we're starting to get there. We have little external details in terms of our gutter and fascia. We need to think about the exterior cladding. And again, just like before, this just terminates. So we can show this continuing up and then being chopped off. But we see that we're just using the same type of material and just repeating it multiple times over, just in different instances. But the biggest thing we're doing, we're not doing anything complicated in ARCHICAD, the biggest thing that we're doing is working with our understanding of construction materiality.